Welcome to the very first episode of Becoming a Good Samaritan, a web show created to encourage, educate, and inspire you to live like the Good Samaritan. Each week we will bring you interviews with Good Samaritans from all walks of life. We aren't going to just interview thought leaders and pastors and scholars and authors. We want to interview people from all walks of life who are committed to living like the Good Samaritan. Our goal is for these interviews to help you become Good Samaritans. Or as today's interviewee has written, our goal is to help you bloom where you're planted. In fact, if, if there's a Good Samaritan you think we should interview, please leave a comment below and, and let us know. The first episode features our good friend Abraham Viella, who is the youth minister at St. Mel's Catholic Church, located in Southern California. You know, Abraham is a great friend of mine and a great friend of the Star Project, and, and not only has the parable of the Good Samaritan deeply impacted his life, he is using the parable of the Good Samaritan to challenge the students that he serves. Becoming a Good Samaritan is created by the Start Project, a nonprofit ministry with a mission to start a Good Samaritan movement. My name is Jared Yapel, and I'm the executive director of the Start Project. If you would like to learn more about the Start Project and upcoming episodes of Becoming a Good Samaritan, go to our website, www.becomingagoodsamaritan.org. And when you get there, look in the right column and subscribe to our newsletter. So again, that's www.becomingagoodsamaritan.org and sign up for our newsletter. Hey, welcome to the very first episode of Becoming a Good Samaritan. Uh, my name is Jared Yapel, and today we're joined by my good friend, Abraham Viella. You know, Abraham is the youth minister at, yeah, Abraham's youth minister at St. Mel's Catholic Church in Norco, California. And frankly, as I was thinking about who to interview for this Becoming a Good Samaritan series, I really couldn't think of anybody better uh, for our first episode than Abraham. Uh, our vision as a nonprofit ministry, the Star Project, is to encourage, educate, and inspire people to live like the Good Samaritan. And that's really the goal for this series, Becoming a Good Samaritan. And I would tell you that in that, Abraham embodies that vision. You know, as I personally have gotten to know Abraham, uh, it's not, you know, he has encouraged, educated, and inspired me to live like the Good Samaritan. There's not a time that we haven't chatted uh, or exchanged a tweet or a Facebook update uh, that I haven't felt encouraged or inspired to, to live like the Good Samaritan. So I'm very excited, very honored to have him as our first guest. You're going to love hearing from his heart about what being a Good Samaritan looks like in his life, but also in the lives that he, of the folks that he's working with, the students he's working with. I think we're going to have a ton of fun. Abraham just told me, hey man, I'm a youth minister, so, so this is, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, and, but anyways, uh, to, to kind of to start and to get going with the interview, I was wondering, Abraham, uh, why don't you take just a few minutes and tell everyone a little bit more about yourself, just kind of some of your background and, and get us started that way. Well, uh, I grew up in Southern California, so, uh, so, you know, it was always hot. It is hot right now. Um, but, uh, you know, growing up, I was, I was a big dude, so I always got teased. So, so kind of from the very beginning, I was always um, humbled because, you know, I didn't have so many friends and I didn't have the best of uh, relationships with people. So I've always kind of a quiet person growing up. In high school, I got into heavy metal music and that was that was my release. And, you know, all, you know, it was metal from all ages. You know, I used to tell people I like my I like my metal, like I like my coffee, black. And, uh, and uh, I heard... It wasn't Poison it, or Def Leppard. <laughs> and uh, at the age of, uh, I think when I was a, when I was a sophomore... Um, I heard the dreaded news that many, uh, many, many, many Catholic uh, teens here say you're going to confirmation. Not which you <laughs> want to go to confirmation, but you're going to confirmation. And I remember uh, my very first class, you know, I went in with my Marilyn Manson t-shirt and I went up to my uh, catechist and I said, hey, listen, um, I don't want to be here and uh, I'm sure you don't want me here, but I'm not a jerk or anything. So I'm just going to sit in the back of the class and uh, just listen to music. I won't bother you, and you know, just don't bother me. 
And, you know, she was very afraid. This big guy with long hair, dressed all black, just kind of basically straight out told her how it was going to go down. Um, her jaw was dropped the entire time. And, uh, and when it ended up happening, you know, I would always use that hour and a half for listening to the new CD of that week, you know? No, no better place to listen to music than at church um, in the middle of a class where you just don't care. Did you just pull the headphones out in the middle of class? Or yeah, no, yeah, you know, I tucked it underneath. And... Because my, my hair was long, they just couldn't tell. Yeah. I was just like this, just doing this in the background, you know, because <laughs> when you listen to heavy metal, you're not just like, yeah. You're just like, you know, you're doing this, and people look at me like if I'm having, you know, an episode or something. And, <laughs> And about a month and a half into class, uh, the the worst thing at the time for me could have happened, but the best thing that could have happened for my soul happened, and and that was I forgot my earphones, and uh, and, yeah, and you I, for, I forgot actually, them. It's like the Lord I, I, had some intention, huh? I, I, for me, I forgot them, but forgot. I think he hit them somewhere. I think he put them like under <laughs> like a shoe or something, yeah. and uh, under my boots. And uh, <laughs> I went to class, and I was just like, great. What am I going to do now? Um, it was funny because at that time I realized that my catechist didn't know my name because there was always another guy missing. So it was, I, my name was either Abraham or Jorge. But she ended up calling me by the shirt I was always wear. Um, there was a band called Murder Dolls, and I always wore their shirt to, to church. So that's what she ended up calling me, Murder Dolls, Murder Dolls. So even on the attendance, it says Murder Dolls was here. And, uh, and uh, for the first time I ever listened to class and and, uh, you know, at first I kind of took a little nap, and then I, when I realized I'd snore a little loud, you know, maybe I was like, okay, I'll just pay attention. So I put my head down and just listened, and, and for the very first time I heard the Word of God. And, wow. and it wasn't just, this is a scripture, but it was, I think at that moment, God was doing something that, uh, that, uh, that's continuing to develop today. And I heard First uh, Peter 5, mm. uh, where it says, I cast all your burdens upon the Lord, for He cares. And honestly, that was the first time I ever heard something like that. You know, to tell me what, you know, it was basically wow. tell me what's going on because I care. And this, you know, 16-year-old tough metalhead was, like, breaking down in the middle of class. And I was like, I'm pretty sure confirmation isn't this intense, you know. Catechism isn't this intense. And, and I kind of just I, I had my head down for the rest of the class just in tears. And, uh, and ever since then, you know, I've been involved. I joined youth ministry at my church at the time. Um, we, at that time we had like president and vice president just, you know, for different, for different roles. And I became president within three weeks. Um, you know, I still wore all the shirts and everything because, you know, that part of my life didn't change. And, uh, and, um, you know, fast forward a couple of years now, I'm a youth minister at a church in our diocese called St. Mel's and, um, small church, but, uh, big hearts there. And, uh, and, uh, that, that was, you know, kind of pretty much, uh, a little bit about me in a, in a nutshell, covered in chocolate. So, <laughs> but uh, so you're no longer wearing the the murder dolls. No, you know what? My youth when I came to this current church, the youth minister time was uh, was 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 a former uh, a former evangelical. So so what ended up happening was like he goes, bro, we should just go away. We should just go and throw away all your shirts. So we came to my house, grabbed all my shirts, grabbed all my CDs. We threw it in the dumpster at church, and he lit a fire in the dumpster. And like you know, he's like, for him it was just like yes, he's released of it. But for me, it was like that's about three hundred dollars worth of stuff. <laughs> I'm like, I'm sure you don't just throw away Ozzy, you know. So, uh, but but you know that was that was his thinking, and now yeah. I just that was a lot of good CDs I threw away. So the place where where you and I met, we actually met through Twitter, right? Was it? Twitter or Facebook? It was. It was a tweet. I remember sending it. I was at my college parking lot um, because I always got to class about two hours early. I don't know why still. And uh, I remember we we watched session three the night before, and I was like, maybe I should just see if these guys are on Twitter. Sure enough, they were. And sure enough, like before I could put my phone down, I guess somebody who was you know like just checking there happened to check the Twitter feed for the Good Samaritan, tweeted right back, and. Uh, I think from there, friendship kind of started. Yeah, yeah. Well, I tell you what, there was, I believe it was that summer, we, uh, at the Start Project, we had two interns, Joe and Emily, and right. you became one of our favorite people. Like, they all, and it was interesting because they're, uh, Twitter's kind of quirky, and sometimes, at that time, we weren't getting a ton of interaction, so um, it was just so fun to, to get to know you and, and stuff through there, and I think you wrote a blog post for the blog uh, that, that summer as well. But um, you kind of speaking towards that 
that session of that curriculum start becoming a good Samaritan. And and for anybody who doesn't know, the Start Project, which is the nonprofit which is now doing Becoming a Good Samaritan, this interview series, the impetus, kind of the thing that launched the idea to do a nonprofit, is this DVD curriculum that was created by Mike Seaton and was published by Zondervan and World Vision. It was called Start Becoming a Good Samaritan. And that curriculum had six sessions and it focused on different issues in the world today, but it really, the, the heartbeat of that message was that parable of the Good Samaritan is incredibly important when it comes to following Jesus. It's, and, it, and it transcends a lot of boundaries. So you could be an, a conservative evangelical Christian. You can be Catholic. You can be a, a, progressive, a, a progressive independent, whatever it might be. But that parable of the Good Samaritan and the idea to love your neighbor really transcends all of that. And that is really this core deep message of what it means to follow Jesus is love your neighbor and you're challenged deeply in that parable. So, so anyways, um, you, you have the opportunity to do that curriculum. Can you tell me a little bit, like, did you, how did, how did you get to doing the curriculum? And then not just the curriculum, we're not looking to do a huge commercial for that, but, but how did then, I guess I did, uh, I just did a big commercial for that. So, <laughs> but, um, but with that start becoming a good Samaritan curriculum, Zondervan World Vision, um, how then did that kind of impact you and, and, and start to, to continue to help you grow in your relationship with God and, and loving God and loving others? Yeah, well, at the time I was going to the young adult ministry at the church and the young adult ministry was, was ran by this amazing guy named Adam. And, uh, and what we would do is we would go over series. And I missed the first series. Um, I, risk, I missed the first uh, session. But then when I went to that, that Monday night session for the second session, I was... I was I was just captivated the entire time because very very I, I felt like the dudes I felt like the dudes uh, when when Jesus when Jesus took off like from Emmaus and he, and like he said uh, we're in our hearts like just burning within us like the entire time I was watching that second session my heart was racing because this was this was Christianity what I've always um, thought it was but because you know but because a lot of other stuff um, it gets in the way. And uh, you know, it kind of it kind of reminded me about my second conversion, and uh, and the second conversion what happened about happened about two years when I went to St. Mills, and uh, you know at the time you know we had this local uh, Christian clothing company called Not of This World, C two eight, and uh, and I was the type of person well they were no we are Christians by my shirt, and so you know I, I wore all the shirts I, I wore the, the shorts if they made it my size. You know, I listened to all the Christ I listened to all the right Christian music and everything, and and just when I watched this series, it took me back to that moment where mm. I was getting off the freeway, and I saw a homeless person there asking for money, and you know, I forgot what the sign said, but as soon as I saw that I was gonna be parked right next to him in that red light, I you know I quickly rolled up the windows and I turned up the music, and I realized that I Christianity I have it wrong. I got I, you know I don't I'm not. I truly don't understand because I was blasting the Christian music to ignore Jesus to the left-hand side of me, that he was in need of help. Like, there's nothing that I could have given him, but there's everything Jesus and me could have given him. You know, maybe just to acknowledge him, acknowledge him, get to know his name. Um, not so much about the money or, or food or whatever, but just the fact that I blocked off encountering Jesus and him, and I blocked off the fact that he could encounter Jesus and me. And when so when I saw the second the second session, my heart was just racing, and then I realized that this this is going to be a change. And I looked at all the other young adults in the room, and and it wasn't like it wasn't you know not not to say anything bad about any you know because before we did like Max Lucado a series we did the Numa series um, you know we we read like Confessions and everything of Saint Augustine, but uh, but my heart was racing, and so I made sure I was there for the for the next series. Then after the third series, I think that's when it when I when I tweeted you guys the following morning, mm -hmm. and it just changed my life. And, this, and, the, and the parable of the Good Samaritan has been something that's just always with me ever since, mm -hmm. because it tells, it reminds us that that not only was God intentional with that parable and in saying it, but we have to be intentional. 
it was I, I still remember those days and you know and I, I even told you before too that you know I watch it I, I just watch it just to, 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 to refresh it to you know to uh, to uh, to just rem remind myself of everything and I even gave you a little a little uh, a little thing about uh, the other day when we're watching the ones the session that that deals with with those in prison and there's this person talking about an archbishop from Argentina yeah. <laughs> and the crazy thing was so I was like okay well where did he say specifically it was and then I looked, you know, when it was, and there was only one archbishop at that time in that region, and that happened to be the current pope. So. That's so amazing because I, I was talking to, to Mike Seaton. I was like, this guy knows this thing better than we do. But if you, um, because it's it's Ron Nickel, right? Right. And I don't. That's not in the main session, isn't that a extra bit? That's an extra bit. So so you were watching like session bonus feature. Of this, you know, in the midst of this, like six session, each session's like forty-five minutes, like they're long sessions, and it's like this bonus sex, se well, bonus spot on this, the fifth. I didn't let is that number five or no, maybe number six, um, where Ron Nickel talks about the Pope. I, I thought that was fascinating when you said that. Um, that's very, yeah, that's that's incredible. It's. The parable, though, I mean, what's great about the parable and how then it informs the series is that the parable, it, on a surface level, the parable has a lot of meanings. Like you, you read it and you go, yeah, there's some good things to take here. But it really is this message where if you, if you start to really pull it apart, like there's a lot there. Like, I don't know, I'm just recently thinking about... Um, an establishment of human dignity, right? Just, just dig the dignity of humanity, and how that is for any person. You know, every person is valuable. I think that's established there, in the or, or is a part of the parable. But it just right. it is really something you can go back to, um, and those, uh, yeah, absolutely, those sessions. There's a lot of really cool, um, cool things to. I, I remember. W we'll watch it. I love the first session. Like there's some really, some really cool spots. I like all the different Christian leaders who are there uh, from different perspectives. And I know that there was a real desire for that curriculum to be multi-denominational, to to really transcend some denominational boundaries and stuff. But um, but but the cool thing is that with that particular series for you, and I've always loved when I talk to you as well, is um, it's not just. Um, this isn't just something you're watching and thinking about and reflecting on. Like, like this is, it's impacted your life at a deep level. And then, so that summer you ended up, you know what's coming. That summer you ended up writing a, 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 a blog post for us. And it was, we just call it the popsicle lady story. I just remember the story by saying. But it's this, it, it's this incredible story. I just wonder if you could maybe share maybe that story and then, also, how now you're thinking about how do I share this parable with students? Some of the things, some you got a couple of stories of how you've then taught the parable of the Good Samaritan to the students you're ministering it to as a youth minister. Yeah, yeah. So, so what ended up happening was, you know, you asked me, would you please, you know, would you mind writing the blog? I was like, yeah, sure. You know, and I remember the first day just thinking about it. I'm like, okay, I want to give them the greatest blog they've ever written in like, I think in less than like 500 words or so or something. And I was like, okay, what am I going to write about? What am I going to write about? What am I going to write about? And then, you know, I'd write stuff down on a piece of paper and I'd throw it. And then, and then I was, and then I was just like, okay, this isn't going anywhere. So I was like, maybe I'll think about it tomorrow. And I'm, and I'm driving, uh, I'm, I'm driving back from, uh, back from St. Mel's and, uh, I forgot what I was doing. I think I had a, I think I had like an afternoon meeting. And as I was driving back, I noticed that one of our, uh, one of our neighbors, who's this um, elderly uh, Mexican lady, um, green, you know, you know, the, you know, Mexican sandals, you know, the most legit, and uh, white hair that was braided, and I noticed she was like carrying like, like nine or ten shopping bags, you know, five in each hand, and and that's just how you know she rolls. And I was like, no, 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 you know, let me let me pull over real quick, put her put her bags in the back, and and take her home because it's hot again, it's California, um, so I pulled over. He goes, oh, hey, mijo, like, you know, como te, como te va? how are you doing? I was like, oh, you can't be walking right now. So I put the grocery bags, and uh, she sits in, and I'm like, here, let me turn on the AC. And, 
And she goes, no, 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 that's just going to waste your gas. I'm like, no, no, it's just like two minutes to go home. So then we get home, you know, pull up through a driveway. I'm like, here, let me, uh, then I'm like, here, let me, uh, I was going to offer to say, here, let me take your bags. And she goes, you mind grabbing the bags and coming on in? And, you know, kind of forward. But I was like, all right, that's what I was going to do anyway. So I get the bags and I take them inside. And she goes, oh, just, you know, leave them right there. And then as I'm putting them down, she goes, can you hand me the bread? I was like, oh, okay. So I hand her the bread. Can you hand me the, 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 the enchilada sauce? Okay, well, here's the enchilada sauce. Basically, she goes down the entire list. She didn't look at no list. She just knew exactly what she had. Then at the very end, she goes, okay, so thank you, mijo. Then she goes to the freezer, and she pulls out, like, one of the one of the popsicles that she has for, like, her grandkids that she watches. And she got one, and, like, she's just, you know, she's telling how hot it is, and she's fanning herself. But there we are in, in like, her kitchen, and we're just both eating popsicles. And, and how that, that, that's, that's the good Samaritan right there. There, there's nobody injured, but there was somebody's, um, there was somebody's, um, uh, feelings being considered. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, I mean, I got a cherry popsicle, you know, I don't know how, (laughs) was it flavor ice? I was wondering if it's one of those long flavor ice popsicles. Dude, they were, it was bomb. I don't care how old you are. Cherry popsicles are banging. They're like, (laughs) great. You know what I love I love that story, and I think if I recall, you called that blog post "Bloom Where You Planted." Bloom, Bloom where you're planted. And I think what I loved about it so much is, you know, it's not like you know you didn't you know dig it. It wasn't like this huge service project where there was a ton going on. But but what I loved about it is it it was initiated by you paying attention and just opening your heart. And and you said this earlier, and I'm and I'm to come back to it, you, you almost found a difference between the things that you could do and the things that you and Jesus could do, right? right? And so kind of thinking of, wait a second, I'm not just driving down the road seeing this lady with these grocery bags. I'm not, I'm not, that's not just me. Like that it's, it's, it's Jesus in me. It's Jesus and me that whereas in, in my, me, just myself, I might just, drive by because I've got an agenda or I need to be somewhere, I'm hungry or whatever it might be. But when you take that extra step to, to think about um, where God might be, where you might be called to bloom, where you were planted that day was to help her. And just and just in addition to that, the beauty of you, you know, thinking of you in the kitchen sharing that cherry pop, that amazing, I'm sure, cherry popsicle. I, it's just, it's an incredible story. You know, I think it was a little old, but hey, it was still good. It was still good because I think she had to reach all the way in the back of the freezer. I don't know how long that thing's been there, but I was just thankful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and now with like how the Good Samaritan kind of parable and this whole series kind of relates to to, to my ministry with with teens is is it's it's really it encompasses everything. You know, when 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 we work with teens and and we trust them with the gospel, we trust them that they're going to be the ones that minister to other teens and. You know, I could just be a resource. I could just be a background. I could just be somebody who organizes everything, who does the paperwork. Um, but like, you know, say for example, um, sometimes it's very easy to get to get a to get a, a little cocky sometimes in ministry. Hey, I'm a teen. I've done all this. Now, you know, I've I've brought people to the Lord, and and what ends up happening, you know, like just just how like honestly everybody else um, in life is is once we once we hit this this role or we think we've been promoted that means that we can no longer do the smaller stuff you know um like say for example i'm the youth minister i get to do all these things with amazing teens however that toilet in the ministry center there's only one person that cleans that and 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 that's me not because not because nobody else signs up to do it but because i it's not just a reminder for me that hey you have to scrub the toilet but it's a reminder like is this job too too small for you to do? Yeah. Or or you know or you know something. So so like with 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 ministry too with the teens, it's you know I tell them the story and and I tell them like does your attitude prevent you from seeing um, the teens that that really need to be invited? Because a lot of the times we invite the teens that constantly go. It's like there's no point in me sending a massive text message to people that were there last Friday for the youth night. Um, but what happens is we need to send a text message out to the to the teens, or actually we need to go personally invite the teens that don't go, 
and and seeing that and you know telling that to the team even yesterday you know you know there's there's no point to invite the people that were going but now since you guys are campus ministers and, and my teens are they're campus ministers now um they're campus ministers they represent saint mel's at their schools and invite people regardless of what denomination they are regardless of of, of where they're at in their, in their walk or whether they believe in God or whether they don't. Um, but like, are you going to pass by that person? Because, you know, again, when you have that role, who, who was it that walked by the priest? It was the priest that walked by. It was, it was, it was the person who had no affiliation with, with, with a higher power. It had no affiliation with, with, with a God or, or, or with an, or with the Christian organization. But it was that person who had no affiliation with yeah. that. that did. Yeah. And I think that's that's a great check for the church. And I think you know Jesus. I think Jesus isn't just saying that for the for the church period, but for the individuals in it too. So you know, and that story gets gets uh, we, we recycle the story because it's applicable in so many ways. And you know, when you tell the teens, anytime a teen gets invited, you know, because you know, there's already two or three teens that. That have gotten invited to go speak at another youth group. The wow. probably the first thing on their on their on their on their uh, thinking what they're going to do the message on is that it's the Good Samaritan. It's that story. It's because it 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 it's it's it encompasses um, not just the characters that that sometimes we play, but it encompasses the story of the Christian faith. That uh, it's it's not just it's not just here. You know, let me uh, let me kind of bring you remedy for a while. But it was the Good Samaritan's expenses. You know, even though, the, and the crazy thing about the story is it didn't say the Good Samaritan cleaned his wounds, you know, or, or, or when he took him to the hotel, you know, kind of aided him. But even though he was on his way somewhere, that didn't stop him from doing anything. You know, yeah. sometimes we're yeah. going to have to clean the fish for sure. But sometimes, you know, just because we're busy or we're, or we're doing an errand, doesn't mean that we can't just stop in this moment. Yeah. Well, and what, and what an important, I mean, don't you think that's an important concept, an important reality to be sharing with students as they're looking forward into their lives? Like, you know, they, they're going to be stepping into careers and stepping into life and, and things like that. Don't you, um, there's another story I think you told me one time. You have a, uh, there's a guy you know who is homeless, and didn't you kind of set up a scenario where they um, kind of passed him by, and then he came back and talked with everybody? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so, um, so uh, I actually heard this from the series, and I decided to do it at a friend's church, and uh, and basically um, we dressed somebody like a homeless person, and uh, and like what we did was basically. We left, you know, we knew that we were going to have a week, so we left some clothes in a pretty raunchy place, so it smelled pretty, pretty bad. And basically, uh, it, was at a, it was at a friend's youth group. So what we did was, before Mass, we had them on the outside of, of the church grounds, but visible enough where if you entered the church, you were going to see this guy. And, uh, so, and, he, and, I told, and I told them, you know, make eye contact with everybody. And uh, so basically, everybody, everybody passed him by, everybody passed him by. Everybody passed him by. And then when it was time for youth group, we moved him over to where the entrance is, to where youth group is, to see if anybody would say anything, anybody would say anything. And um, sure enough, nobody did. And, uh, and when they invited the speaker to go up, the homeless person went up, took off all of his clothes, and he began, he began to, uh, to talk about um, the Good Samaritan. And... And you know, and it wasn't their fault that they didn't say anything or they didn't do anything, but now that they know, they have to realize that you know your eyes are more your eyes are more to just see the latest Instagram photos, or your eyes are more than to just watch the latest movie, but your eyes primarily is a gift to to look for people in distress, to look for people that are in need, to look for people who are hurting. That way, you can be a good Samaritan because you know he didn't. He wasn't asking for money. All, all honestly, in his little, um, in his uh, cardboard cutout thing, all he said was, uh, I'm, "I'm praying for you." And I wonder if anybody noticed that. And you know, when he showed them, "I was praying for you," it, I think it was a powerful moment. I think it was a powerful moment, not just for the teens, but for the leaders too, because nobody knew. No, only only the one person in the youth group knew. So that was cool. 
Yeah. Uh, it, it just seemed that the, the way the parable of the Good Samaritan has had this kind of uh, tremendous impact on you, but it's leading toward a youth ministry that has depth to it. You know, you're not just, and, and not that, that this is always bad, but you're not just maybe taking on topical situ things to speak about and share with the students. And I'm sure you do that in some parts, but instead you're, you're saying, no, like love your neighbor. We, you know, I want you to love God, but love your neighbor is linked to that. And, and really just pushing toward that. And, and the reason why I say that is um, as we continue to maybe chat a little bit about uh, the ministry that you're doing now, you, you, you just recently had a retreat with the students, right? And, right. I, and I thought it was incredible how you integrated the parable of the Good Samaritan into um, um, sharing the gospel, the good news. And, and, yeah. and the students, because you, you talked about how um, you were sharing this great good news of the gospel with these students who are there and using the parable to do it. And then also the response. I just, that's the story of, of what's happened. And this is like, this is last weekend, right? This is only, this is two weekends it's ago? Days ago, five days ago. This is really fresh. And it's just, and it's an incredible story. Would you, would you be willing to share that? Yeah, so kind of a, a little bit before, you know, I was telling, uh, this is our first retreat where it was a teen-led retreat. So we had a group of 25, but then um, we had 55 teens go on retreat. So you had a total of about 80 teens, period. So um, so what ended up happening was I was telling a lot of youth ministers, hey, we got this thing going, and they're like, I don't know if it's going to work. You do realize that when you have a, you know, a team that's led by teens, you know, they're going to have to deal with a lot of stuff. And you know, then, then when I told them, well, who's doing the talks? The teens are doing the talks. You know, I don't know, you know, I don't know if that's responsible, you know, to just throw them in there. Like, you know, are you, know, are you sure and all these things? And I was like, dude, you guys need to be supporting me. Like, what's going on? And and uh, so, and I, I told our teens that too, not as a sense of saying, hey guys, people like aren't believing in us, but you know, but it, it's sad that ministry is not being done like this. So, um, so sure enough, we went on the retreat. The teens were just amazing. Um, anytime, anytime, like in the beginning when we walk, you know, when they were, when they were, when they were coming in and not everybody was there, there was a leader speaking to a teen, not, Hey, you know, not just shoot the breeze. Like what school do you go to? But like, you know, what, what brought you here? Like, what, what's your story? What's your background? And like, let's, you know, and all that was going great. Uh, fast forward to Saturday night. Saturday night, um, we have this adoration night, and uh, and one of our teens, um, one of our teens, her name's Andy. I'm so proud of Andy. Um, basically, what we do is we invite the teens to come up, to come up around around the Eucharist, around the monstrance, and maybe for the first time, do a sincere prayer. And, and she invited them to come up, and a lot of you know, I would say about ninety percent of the kids came up. Ninety percent of the kids came up, which is great, you know, and and. Um, and, you know, not only when the teens came up, but you had the leaders praying over them, too. It's so so then, you know, fast forward about 30 minutes and the whole room is like teens praying over teens. And you forget who's the teens and who are the leaders. But they're just for this moment, all teens. And I also noticed that there were some teens that didn't go up. And obviously, for many reasons, you know, they could have, you know, they chose not to go up. But I immediately thought about the Good Samaritan. Like, you know, well, what am, what are we doing? And more specifically, what am I doing? Because I'm like the only one not doing anything. The worship team's playing. The teens are doing something. The retreat directors are praying over teens. So I was like, okay, I'm just like the complacent youth minister back here. So then I was like, well, what, what, can, what can I do to get those that aren't going up? Because sure, people are praying over them, but they haven't gone up. And, um, and I was like, okay, well, you know, if I was them, I would want somebody – to get me because you know if because if I wanted to go I would want somebody to come get me and I would go up with them so what I ended up doing was uh, we, we uh, I went up there and I talked a little bit about my life and I said how how uh, you know um, my life the reason I'm here is because somebody took me by the hand and brought me they love me that much kind of like intercession intercession is not just hey I'm praying for you but intercession is taking the person that you're praying for his hand 
and taking Jesus' hand and uniting them. That's what intercession is. So I was like, okay, this is what I want to do. So I went up there and you know, uh, shared a little bit about my story. And then I said, you know, if, if, if you're that type of person that's like me, where you need to have somebody bring you up or you need to have, you know, you need to just be able to, um, cause some of them may not want to do it. So I was like, well then, you know what, if that's the case, I'll hold Jesus for you. Like, like, like I'll, I'll take, you know, I'll, I'll be this, um, this representative for you, you know? And, you know, so what I ended up doing is I'm closing my eyes and I just said a little prayer, like, like, God, uh, um, let your hand bring these people to you. Let your hand bring these people to you. And before I could open my eyes, before I could open my eyes, the one girl that I saw that was really, really hurting, and I ended up finding out later that that the DRE called me, Emily, awesome person. She said, did, did Diana go to the retreat? Because this is her last chance to get confirmed because I guess she was missing a whole bunch of classes or whatever. And boom, she was hit, right? God just totally like, just like placed his hands over her heart. She came up. She touched Jesus. She touched the monstrance. And then slowly, everybody in the room, everybody in the room was around each other. It was one big circle. And for some reason, God set it up where at that time, that's where the chorus was going for how he loves and the teens for 15 minutes. It was kind of like Kumbaya version two. And they just started singing, oh, how he loves us own. And in the middle of the singing, I put, I said something, then, you know, this is nothing that I said or I thought of, but, but God is saying like, isn't it crazy how when you go and, 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 and you want to accept Jesus into your life, it's not just you get a, you get a father, but you get a son, you get a brother, you get a sister, you get, you get a whole bunch of people. And for 15 minutes, they sang. But I think what they were doing was, was they were joining the choir in heaven. Although our song may have not been holy, 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 their song was, oh, how he loves, oh, how he loves us. And, uh, and that for that 15 minutes, um, for those 15 minutes, honestly, like, and I think this is where my tweet came from, uh, from last night, where, uh, where uh, honestly, there was, there's no greater honor in my life than being a youth minister um, and seeing that. And, you know, because I always thought that being a youth minister was bringing teens to God. I always thought being a youth minister was, was, was you know, hanging out with the teens and, you know, you know going to do stuff um, with them that, that's going to be funny or whatever. But I found out that youth ministry, youth ministry was doing paperwork, was was doing all the was getting yelled at by parents because youth nights went over. But at that moment, I kind of said to myself, and I told the teens this yesterday, because I wanted to go into graphic design. But I told the teens yesterday, and it got confirmed in that moment in my life that for the rest of my life I want to be in youth ministry, even if that means that I won't have that house. You know, I may have to work full time somewhere else. But to me, that's totally worth it because that retreat, it was teens for teens. And and now they're going to know the story of the Good Samaritan. Not because we said it, we opened up the word and, hey, read it. But because the fact that they knew, like, people will bring you. And because you've been brought in, you're going to want to bring others. And sure enough, last night, on Friday night, was our biggest youth night ever. And it was the first time. Hey, well, we just had a little bit of a glitch. So I apologize if there's a little disruption here. But um, as we've been talking, Abraham, um, one of the things that keeps coming to my mind is this great verse with John the Baptist where he says, I must decrease and he must increase. And I think as you talk about uh, the ministry that you're involved in, um, it just, it, it what it feels like is that you just get out, you get out of the way so that God can do great things. You know, like your, your ministry is not about you. You know, it's not about being the cool big brother. It's not about making a bunch of funny jokes. And I mean, there, you probably, I know you do make funny jokes and I know you're an awesome kind of big brother figure and such. And, and, and some of those things happen, but that's not what it's about. Like for you, it's about getting out of the way so that, so that God can, can, can change their lives, that, that they can encounter Jesus and, and fall in love with Jesus and, and have their lives changed and transformed. And I, I just think that's amazing. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So you, um, so now you're kind of at this place where uh, the students are taking ownership and possession of ministry, and and you've seen some really cool change, and and such. But where um, where are things headed now? Um, what are some cool things you're going to be involved in? And also, how is the maybe the parable of the Good Samaritan continuing to shape your life? And then also, just to, yeah, I don't know, maybe breaking it into three questions. Three questions in one. Um, what would you say to other folk, other people? Like, what are some of the things you've told other people when it comes to parable of the Good Samaritan? Um, and, and some key pointers for people. Because the name of this is Becoming a Good Samaritan. So if someone's listening to this and saying, how do I become a good Samaritan? Maybe, and I know through some of this, you may have answered or alluded to some answers, but what would you say to that person? Yeah, well, what we're going next um, to kind of just answer them in order is, is during summer. summer. Summer normally is like the quiet time, not for us um, at the retreat. We ended up saying, okay, we're going to have a girls group. We're going to have a guys group that meets during summer. 40 girls signed up for the girls group. Wow. Crazy. Um, I think we're going to have like 12 guys for the guys group. So, you know, um, guys, you need to step up your game. Um, uh, you know, we're going to be going over this curriculum called Theology of the Body. Um, we're also going to, you know, we, we, we've taken this revamped uh, approach to our Friday nights. That's going to start happening. We're going to include a junior high night, um, you know, slowly, slowly getting into there. Um, uh, and the great thing is I have this, I have the next theme for the next retreat. And uh, the great thing is, I, I have already, I have everything, you know, uh, drawn up, and I'm just going to present it to them and say, I trust you. And uh, and and uh, there obviously there's going to be two or three main leaders of the team, and and we call them lifeguards. Um, so the retreat team, uh, actually, it's the core team for youth ministry. We're going to call them lifeguards. This new theme uh, I actually took from a, a song off of Hillsong's uh, new album. It's called Oceans Where Feet May Fail. And basically, that that is the that is the that is basically what Christianity is. It's oh, this awesome. living this life in the middle of the storm, where we think that our boat, which sometimes is our pride, our personality, all of my accomplishments, where that thing is going to sink quick. But sometimes the safest place to be out in this in the ocean is is right alongside with Jesus, and you find that that as soon as He comes to rescue you, um, He wants you to rescue somebody. So we're giving them this team the title of lifeguards. Um, and, uh, so that's going to happen for the next year. These two retreats will be based around that. Um, we're going to have it for the freshmen, sophomores, and then a retreat for the juniors and seniors. And, uh, as far as like the advice I could give to people about how to start becoming a good Samaritan is, is I think it's kind of, uh, beautifully put in one of the last parts of one of the sessions where it's to have, just to have open eyes and, um, like, like, and, and that's what I've been telling the teens is, you know, part of being a youth minister is you bring them to Jesus, but then, you know, during relational time, you may bring them to tacos, or you may bring them to ice cream, or you may bring them to all these other places where you go to hang out. And yesterday, me and one of the teens, uh, one of the teens, and then I think it was their dad, yeah, me and one of the teens and their dad, we went out for tacos, and um, and we saw this homeless person kind of outside, outside the taco shop, right? And... I told them, you know, I told them, oh, you know, uh, uh, would you like some food? And uh, and what he had, he couldn't see anything, and he was doing this with his mouth. And I think he was showing us he had no teeth. And the dad said, well, okay, guess not. And then he walks in, and at that point, that's where the good Samaritan needs to be intentional. Okay, he didn't say anything because he was showing us he had no teeth, so he probably couldn't have tacos. We probably couldn't have a burrito or a torta or whatever it was. So trying to communicate with him. We spend about 10 minutes, you know, communicating with him. And he's basically telling us that he uses the money that he gets to go buy, like, the, the naked juice protein, you know, the protein drinks or whatever or something like that. And we went over and we hooked him up with some. And uh, and, and, and that that's what it is. It's intentional. It's not just, okay, you want some food? Oh, no, you don't want food? Okay, fine. You know, I was just trying to help no, you have to sometimes, well, first of all, you have to know their name because you have to know that they're just as significant as you are. 
yeah. although in yeah. some rough circumstances, that you know, secondly is, is 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 letting them know that you know that that you don't want to be just those other people that just pass them by. And it's this 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 whole open your eyes thing isn't just for isn't just for the homeless people, but it's you know um, it's 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 for people in our neighborhood. It's for the it's for the the teens that always look down because. They don't have anybody to talk with. Looking at them, and, and, and uh, um, one of my one of our uh, our uh, our uh, youth ministers, her name's Angie Lopez or Angie Pearson. I always say Angie Lopez because she's going out with Ralphie Lopez, and they're pretty much about to get married anyway. So um, she at the retreat took a great investment into one of the girls from a different church who decided to come on this retreat, and she was just like quiet the entire time. Angie was relentless in her love for her. Angie was relentless into like investing in her the entire weekend. You know, um, anytime, you know, she, she basically just brought him. It was an instant friendship. It was not a youth minister teen relationship. It was a, a friendship relationship. They even took a picture together. And Monday morning, she changed her profile photo to her and her, and, and, and her friend that she made. And that made her life. And it's not because we're trying to minister this person to bring this person Jesus, but we want to let this person know that you know I don't know what's going on in your life, or but you have an instant friend with us. And she just didn't make Angie as a friend, but she made her boyfriend as a friend. She made me as a friend. Now we're constantly bugging her, and she goes, "Oh, what you know?" Now, now, poor girl, what is she thinking? You know, dang. Now they're, they're always texting me. They're always telling me they love us. They're always telling me these things. It's a good problem to have, you know. Yeah. Basically. Just have open eyes and, and know that and know that uh, poverty exists in not just ways of, of finances, but but you know, but with low self esteem, um, people who are depressed, uh, the handicap. Um, I have a nephew who who's like that, um, who who he can't move, he can't talk. He, he's nine years old. He has to eat through a through a tube, and 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 you know, fa- uh, our pastor, Father Declan, one day at a at a homily, he was saying is um is people like him. They have the most beautiful gift of purity. Um, although they may never open up and blossom, but just to know the fact that their purity is going to be perfectly preserved for when the kingdom comes, it's everybody to see. Um, uh, so it's just honestly have have open eyes and and know that um, there's people like that everywhere. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Are they worth it to, to say, if Jesus is worth your time, then they're worth your time. You know, it's like what Shane Claiborne said, how can you worship a homeless man on Sunday but ignore one on Monday? Um, so it, it goes it goes beyond homelessness, it goes beyond it goes beyond all that. It goes it goes into basically just being a friend, just being Jesus. And uh, one of my role models his name's Mark Hart, he basically and I think this sums it up is 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 being able to encounter Jesus and that other person. And having other people being able to encounter Jesus in me. Because sometimes a teen's not going to need to talk to me. They're not going to need to have an encounter with me. But what they're going to need to have is an encounter with Jesus in me. Or vice versa, you know? So, and, you know, for those of you guys that are in ministry watching this, um, like when you guys go to a meeting, like is, is the purpose of that meeting, sure, you have to get stuff down. You have to get stuff completed. You have to get tasks done. But... In that meeting, shouldn't there be an encounter with Christ and everybody? Because it's not just, all right, this ministry, let's get this job done. But it's this ministry, how can I help you in your life? Like, what's going on with you? Praying together. um, Because if it doesn't start there, it won't start anywhere else. And if if I can go and and, and talk with a homeless person or spend time at at the local senior citizen center or whatever it is, whatever it is at the time. But I go to ministry and I'm just like chop, chop, chop. That needs to get done. That needs to get done. Then it, this this thing has to encompass the whole our whole life. Not just when you're driving on the freeway. And honestly, because of it, I'm a I'm a completely different person. I'm a completely different person. I've, I've changed, and I think that's the greatest that's the greatest uh, kind of uh, a self realization you can come to. That that uh, that I'm different. So it's like the song goes, like I'm a wretch, you know. Like when, because if I think about what makes me me, yeah, that that's a rush. Like if I think about what I want to think about or what I want to watch or what I want to see, yeah, it's, you know, sometimes it's not so kosher. 
But the thing is, it's but it's because Jesus, Jesus picked me up. Mm. Jesus washed my wounds. Jesus, wow. this whole time, said, hey, here, take care of him. And when I come back, I'll pay it in full. So it's uh, it's a beautiful thing. Wow. wow. Abraham, thank you so much for your time. Um, I will bill you later. What's that? I will bill you later. You bill me later. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> no, I, I thought that was a perfect, just a perfect place to stop, you know. Um, just focused on the Lord Jesus and, and how he um, humbled himself, you know. So is that like it says in Philippians, you know. Um, humbling himself to the point of death. That at his name every knee shall bow, you know, and that really becomes the the response. The response to that is loving your neighbor, becoming a good Samaritan, caring for others, and sharing that good news with them. Um, and I think really just through your life, through the, the through the things you're involved in, and through your reflections, I really believe that anybody listening or watching this uh, has definitely been. Uh, inspired to live like the Good Samaritan. I just want to say thank you very much. <coughs> you know, I thought when we would do these shows, I thought that we'd uh, end each one the same way. And so I wanted to end the interview, our time together, with that quote from Mother Teresa that is in that START curriculum. You know, yesterday is gone. Tomorrow has not yet come. We have only today. Let us begin. Thank you. Thank you, Abraham. Hey, I hope that you enjoyed this first episode of Becoming a Good Samaritan. Actually, my biggest hope is that you have found yourself encouraged, educated, and inspired. And if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to ask you two things before we go. First, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter so you can hear more about the START Project. And second, would you be willing to leave a comment below and share the part of Abraham's interview that was most meaningful to you? Thank you so much.